Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, or good night, and welcome or welcome back to Crash Course Economics. Uh, it's great to see so many attendees today. Actually, I think we are reaching records today. Uh, we had over 200 registrations. So uh, we have a YouTube uh, channel posted for you as well, and uh, the overflow of attendees uh, can join the webinar there, and we will also collect questions there. So for now, I'd like to ask you to please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, my introduction, so my name is Sarah. Uh, I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at TNI, the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Krollsmith, a web developer, uh, Kees Hudig from Global Info, who is actually absent today, and Jenny Pannebecker from SOMO, who are working very hard behind the scenes to make this webinar series a success. Um, so we together form a collective of engaged activists and experts from several organizations and we united at the start of the corona crisis in order to understand the crisis a little bit better and try to develop ideas on how to solve it. So uh, about Crash Course, uh, we're a platform, online platform, we're designed to open up the debate on how we can move from the current crisis and make also the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. So in order to do that, we're inviting global experts to break down complex issues, mainly macroeconomic and finance issues, and to make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way together. And in this way, we hope to democratize the necessary knowledge and to provide you with the tools to change the world uh, adherently. Um, and in doing so, we really try to get at the heart of the matter of complex problems. Uh, so we get a better grasp on them and also uh, can provide more future proof and green solutions. Uh, in our current modus, we're organizing a webinar every two weeks. So that's twice a month. Um, good for you to know. Uh, there will be a recording of this webinar and also a podcast version and a transcription on the website. And we'll also share links uh, that our speaker might refer to. Uh, and the former recording uh, of the webinar with Andrew Fisher two weeks ago and the transcript are already online. So, Rodrigo, um, may I give you the floor? Yes, well, um, very briefly, um, as Sarah already mentioned, uh, our aim is uh, to understand how our highly financialized societies are being shaped by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we try to look at well several dimensions. Uh, in the first series, we focused on uh, monetary policy, uh, central banks and ideology, uh, central banks uh, have been uh, well a large player, a growing player since the the, the previous financial crisis, and and also since March this year. Uh, well, their activities have had many implications, and this was what the first series was about. And in the second series, we will focus on uh, the structural problems that uh, developing countries or the global south, uh, for a lack of a better term, uh, face uh, today, uh, and how their previously existing problems have been um, well, augmented uh, with the with the current crisis situation and perhaps even will turn into a new debt crisis. Um, so that is basically the aim of this second series. To, to, today we talk about uh, dependency theories uh, and the next time uh, we will talk about uh, subordinate financialization. Right, thanks Rodrigo. So uh, just for you to know to know what's coming, uh, the setup of this webinar is as following. Uh, shortly the speaker will be introduced and she will present her vision uh, in about 15-20 minutes. Um, thereafter Rodrigo and I will interview her for another 15 minutes and in the end we'll have a round of questions from your side. And those questions will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. So that's another 15, 20 minutes. So I'd like to ask you all, uh, introduce yourself in the chat, and then you can use the special Q&A tab, uh, which you find at the bottom of your screen, where you can pose your question. And we'll make a selection based on the questions that are posed over there. If you like a question, you can endorse it by putting a thumbs up, which makes uh, the most endorsed questions appear uh, at, the, at the top of our screen. Um, so, Rodrigo, I'd like to give you the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yes, well, we are very happy to have today with us uh, Ingrid Harvold Kwangreven. Um, I hope I pronounced this name correctly. Um, 
Uh, she is a, an assistant professor in development uh, in international development at the University of York. Um, and her research is centered on the role of finance in development um, and the structure of features of underdevelopment. Uh, she is a founder and editor of the blog uh, development, Developing Economics uh, and also a founder uh, and steering group member of the Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics. Um, so, uh, Ingrid, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Rodrigo, and thank you for the invitation. Let me just pull up my slides. Um, here we go. And uh, congratulations on putting together such an amazing crash course. I've been following it myself, and I will be watching the the other sessions as well. It's been, um, I think it's a really great um, lineup, and it's amazing to be a part of it and to get the opportunity to talk about dependency theory. Um, so I wanted to talk about what it is. Uh, why it uh, has gone out of fashion, or why everyone is saying that it's outdated. Um, I want to present my own redefinition of dependency theory and just discuss briefly how it can be applied today. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments um, towards the end of the session as well. Um, so this is something that I, I mean, I was introduced to dependency theory as an undergraduate and a master's student, but it was always presented as something that was a theory of the past that wasn't relevant anymore. That's how you encounter it in textbooks um, and in articles. And uh, <clears throat> as a PhD student, that was also the impression that I'd had, but I was curious to read more. And that's kind of where this project started. Um, I wanted to find out why, why are people saying that it's outdated? What exactly is it that was wrong with dependency theory? Um, is it all dependency theory? Is it like some dependency theory that's outdated? Um, why is there this kind of, there seems, there seemed to be, to me at the time, to be a, um, a lot of um, uh, very critical reactions towards dependency theory from all kinds of camps, really, um, mainstream as well as critical. So, um, what is dependency theory? As I, started to try to answer this question as a PhD student, I realized that it's actually a very difficult question to answer. And depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. Um, and that is because there isn't one dependency theory. A dependency theory is a body of scholarship that um, stretches decades. Depending on how you define it, you could say it stretches centuries. Um, it's very often associated with um, Latin American uh, scholarship, but it's not just Latin American. You also have Samir Amin, who's an important dependency theorist, who passed away just a couple of years ago. And, um, and you have scholarship like um, colonial drain theory, which, which originated in India, which also has a lot of elements of dependency theory, even though that was a long, it was, uh, conceptualized and produced way before dependency theory became um, a term. So André Gunder Frank is perhaps the most famous dependency theorist, at least in the global north. In the global south, you'll have very um, uh, different different scholars that people will refer to when they talk about dependency theory. For example, Celso Furtado in Brazil, Tavares as well in Cardoso, Dos Santos, there's a wealth of different dependency theories across Latin America and also in other parts of the world. So just to give a definition that's very often referred to, um, so De Santos sees dependency as a situation in which the economy of certain countries is conditioned by the development and expansion of another. So that's a very kind of general definition. He doesn't say here in the definition how it's conditioned, um, what that means, why it's conditioned, um, but there is this um, aspect of conditioning, that there's a link between a developing country and the global economy, um, and, and that it affects the opportunity for development. I, uh, I came across this definition, I didn't find it satisfying, but I think it is a good starting point to understand 
what dependency theorists were interested in. So there's disagreement among dependency theorists and lots of debate about what dependency is, how it was historically produced, what it means, what space there is for development, if it's even possible to develop. Um, and this is a really, like, it's a really rich scholarship that I would encourage all of you to go and like, and read, um, because there's really interesting debates. There were like lots of special issues in the 60s and 70s, where Marxists and structuralists and Keynesian and institutionalists were all debating different aspects of dependency and what that meant for the periphery, which is the terminology they use for the global south. There are different ways of defining the strands within dependency theory. Very often, you'll, um, you'll, they'll be split into two or three camps. They have the Latin American structuralists, the neo-Marxists, uh, but there's also overlap, and it's difficult to kind of um, categorize them uh, very clearly. And you find similar ideas in other uh, scholarship as well, as I mentioned, that doesn't necessarily consider itself dependency theory, like colonial drain theory. Or staple theory was a theory that emerged in Canada in the 1930s, where they look at how Canada is dependent on the U.S. Um, and there's other... other um, strands of dependency like theories as well that I um I write about in in the paper that I eventually published after my PhD going through all these years of reading about the debates about dependency theory. So it has gone out of fashion. That's um kind of clear. Um I just put up two um screenshots from to newspaper articles that I came across when I was researching dependency theory. It's been referred to as being uh, in the dustbin of history <laughs> by foreign policy. And um, dependency theory, is it all over now? It's actually an article in The Guardian where they don't dismiss dependency theory. This is written by Jonathan Glenny, who I saw joined the, <laughs> joined the webinar just now. Um, but, um, but here in the article, they're saying, oh, it's been likened to conspiracy theories, right? So that's how dependency theory has been seen by the public, or is very often seen by the public. So why did it go out of fashion? That's a big question. And um, that was one of the things that I was very interested in. And I found three main reasons. So there are epistemological reasons, things that are scholars find things that are wrong with the theory and therefore see that as a reason to discard it. There are empirical reasons, so things that have changed in the global economy that some would say makes dependency theory irrelevant. It's not relevant anymore. Maybe it was relevant in the 50s and 60s, but now things have changed so drastically that uh, it's become outdated. Um, and there are political reasons. And uh, by political, I mean the politics of academia, the politics of knowledge production, there, what theories become dominant is not necessarily just a question of which theories explain phenomena the best. It's also a political, political um, uh, phenomena. So that's something that I think is extremely important to understand why dependency theory became marginalized. And I'll come back to that. So I'll go, I'll quickly go through all three of them. So epistemological, there was lots of critique of dependency theory in the 60s and 70s and 80s. By the 80s, late 80s, basically everyone agreed that dependency theory was uh, uh, something to be discarded to the dustbin of history. Uh, but the problem with this was that the theories that were criticized were very often kind of straw men of dependency theory. So Cardoso called this, um, yes, that the way dependency theory was consumed, especially in the U.S., made it into the straw man easy to destroy. It was simplified. It was stereotyped. It was caricatured. Um, and Andre Gunder Frank, who is maybe like a more simplified version of dependency theory, was often taken as a spokesperson for the whole body of very rich and diverse scholarship. So you have lots of scholars criticizing uh, Frank and also Wallerstein uh, in the 70s that became um, 
widely read and seen as kind of the end of dependency theory. Like Brenner, for example, had this um, important critique in 1977 where he critiques Frank and Frank and Wallerstein. Um, so, so there's misunderstandings about it being one theory. So that led to one Frank being becoming a spokesperson, uh, but it also led to this misunderstandings related to for those people that did read beyond Frank. Uh, they would see confusion rather than debate. They'd be like, oh, in this article, dependency is referred to as this thing, and this other article is referred to as something else. Uh, they don't even know what they're talking about. They can't even define what dependency theory is. Um, so that's the kind of the, the impression you get when you read Lal, which was another important article in, in 1975, where he says, you know, dependency theory is just a confused body of scholarship. Um, but of course, I mean, there may be some confused dependency theorists, sure, uh, but the confusion he was seeing was actually a disagreement among among dependency theorists. There's also more serious um, critiques, like it being tautological, um, and this is something that I think some dependency theorists are sometimes um, uh, guilty of. They say, oh, you know, this country is dependent, so therefore it's poor. It's poor because it's dependent, without really explaining, but where does the dependency come from? Uh, what, how is it historically produced? I think most of the dependency scholarship does um, go back in history and explain how these dependent um, financial and productive structures were produced, but it's not always the case. So there is some pathological elements there. Uh, it's been critiqued for being reductionist, mechanic, denying agency among actors in the global south. And uh, again, I think it's usually these critiques come uh, from a misunderstanding or from taking one theory and um, drawing conclusions based on that one theory about the whole scholarship, which um, isn't really a strong epistemological critique. It's just a critique of one element. Um, so these are some epistemological critiques, and I think it's important to take some of them on board when we take the research program forward and make sure that, you know, it's not tautological or that it isn't reductionist. Uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of these critiques are based on misreadings and misunderstandings of, of the scholarship. So now on to the empirical, and that is maybe something that you might be more familiar with that you often hear that it's outdated. It was possible to develop in, uh, within capitalism, within global capitalism. East Asian countries were able to develop. Capitalist development is possible. Therefore, dependency theory is wrong. They say it's impossible. That's kind of the logic that I often heard when I um, asked about dependency theory. Um, I think this is uh, wrong, again. And I'll bring up an example of uh, how I think dependency theory actually can explain the development of South Korea. Uh, most dependency theorists don't say that development is impossible or that industrialization is impossible, but they study how it's very difficult, the constraints and um, the particularities of, um, of development in countries that face all of these constraints. So, um, and Prebish has actually been used to also explain South Korea. So. Raoul Prebish is one of um, kind of the uh, dependency theorists that's quite well known. Another empirical reason for um, that people use to justify why it should be seen as outdated is the spread of global value chains, which means that uh, well, peripheral countries can now enter global value chains and industrialize. They can move into manufacturing. So therefore, this is a whole different global economy that we see. Um, many would argue that dependency theory is mostly about looking at how developing countries export raw materials and then trade them for industrial goods and that that is what creates a dependent relationship. Um, but um, and Raoul Prebisch is especially kind of well known for making this argument, but actually he didn't make that argument. He made an argument about the type of exports that peripheral countries export, um, which were often raw materials at the time. Um, but he also made the point that low value added manufacturing goods could have the same types of properties that, um, that raw material 
uh, exports could have. So um, just because a country moves into like manu light manufacturing doesn't mean that um, the conclusions that he drew aren't still valid. Um, and so in order to illustrate this point more, I'm going to bring in um, an example of a country that has been highly integrated into global value chains to show how a dependency theory approach to the development in that country can still generate important insights. So I'm going to look at Indonesia in a second. And now finally, political reasons. As I alluded to earlier, research programs don't necessarily move forward based on an objective measure of progress. It's not like uh, science is cumulative, especially not the social sciences, where we just learn more and more and more and objectively improve our understanding of the world. There's lots of debate, big political debates within the social sciences um, and struggle for resources, struggle for being able to determine the narrative to set the terms of the debate. It's a very political process. And uh, in the context of the Cold War, uh, there were, this was especially acute in economics, uh, where neoclassical economics came to be the dominant um, theory in economics departments, especially in the US and in Europe, uh, which present capitalism as a more um, har uh, harmonious system than what dependency theory, for example, does. Uh, it's not just dependency theory that was squeezed out since the 70s in economics departments. It's also uh, Marxist economics, Keynesian economics, institutional economics. So economics generally is narrowed a lot. And economics is the most extreme, but you see similar tendencies in all of the social sciences, or in a lot of the social sciences, at least. So those are the political reasons for why dependency theory was marginalized. So with that in mind, um, I would like to just briefly present, and we can talk more about it in the Q&A if you would like, but I'd like to present how I would like to define dependency theory in order to uh, demonstrate how it can still be relevant, and also because it hasn't really been defined as a research program uh, before. The definitions that existed, um, or that exist, I mean, there are definitions, but they tend to be either focused on Latin American theories or focused on specific elements within dependency theory or specific theoretical traditions within dependency theory, uh, but not looking at it as a research program. Um, so I followed Lakatos here to, to, de to develop this and to define this. Um, he sees research programs as a collection of interrelated theories that have a common hypothesis that form the hard core. And this framework has been used to define lots of different uh, research programs. It's quite interesting to, to look at kind of the, um, how different approaches to economic questions have been defined. Neoclassical economics can also be defined in this way. Um, so a research program, a new research program doesn't necessarily explain the same question better, but rather different things from other research programs. So you'll see here that I put that a core hypothesis in dependency theory is that global capitalism tends to be polarizing. So it has inequality at its core to what it's trying to explain, um, this polarizing tendencies in global capitalism. That's different from if you look at, um, like for example, development economics uh, today, the core things that, um, that discipline tries to explain tend to have more to do with poverty reduction, more micro-oriented questions. So then these research programs are explaining different things, right? Um, so it's not necessarily that, um, well, dependency theory was, um, was more mainstream in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's not like it was replaced by a research program that was looking at the same questions, but approaching it differently. Actually, it was replaced by a body of um, theories that ask different kinds of questions. So, and then within that, so there's the hypothesis, but then within the research program, 
uh, scholars will approach the hypothesis differently and they'll have different theories of why global capitalism tends to be polarizing. So you have the monopoly capitalists um, that look at monopoly capitalism leading, leading to unequal exchange. You have the terms of trade debate within the dependency tradition and you have those that look at the financial constraints as the main driver of global inequality. Uh, so there's differences there. Uh, but what um, I think is key and similar or the same across all of the tradition is in addition to this hypothesis that they take a global historical approach. So the method is the same. And they focus on structures of production and constraints faced by peripheral economies. And also, I would say that um, they focus on both, and it's important that they focus on both, but also the relationship between the two. And I believe that those are some of the strengths of the research program. So that if we want to push this research program forward and we think it's relevant, these are the things that are important to retain. And then there are some weaknesses in some theories that we could you know, discard. <laughs> So that's what it is. That's how I worked to define it. Um, and now I just want to apply it quickly. I see that uh, I've already spoken for 10, 15 minutes, but um, I just want to show how it's relevant. Um, and as I said, I want to look at South Korea because that's a case that's often used to discredit dependency theory. And I want to look at Indonesia with the global value chain. Um, so I'll just do that um, rather briefly. And with South Korea, actually, Andrew Fisher talked about this at length in the last episode of the crash course. So you can watch a more in-depth explanation of the external constraints of um, South Korea on the SOMO website. Um, but I, so I think that when explaining South Korea's um, development, industrialization, it's important to take a historical approach to see how uh, capitalism developed in a particular way in South Korea. And um, there was this development of industrial capitalism during colonialism in South Korea, which is quite different from the way capitalism developed in other colonies. So Korean businessmen, as Eckert writes, Eckert writes was, uh, they were not so much subordinated by the political structure, but incorporated into it. So there was a Korean, um, uh, there was a class of Korean industrialists that emerged during colonialism. Very different from the very extractive colonialism that you see in, in other uh, colonies. And then uh, this development of the production structures and ownership during colonialism laid the foundations um, for the industry that later emerged at, as what we um, now know as the developmental state. So that's been written about at length, right? Amston, Jibber, Margulis. But I think that you know the, a lot of the developmental state literature is very focused on the um, policies that were implemented, and that's really important. Uh, but I think to fully understand why this was possible in South Korea and maybe not somewhere else, uh, we need to also understand the historical development of capitalism in South Korea. And then on the external constraints, as Andrew talked about at length, um, they were, they could have been there. I mean, they are usually there for peripheral economies, but in the case of South Korea, which was next to North Korea, so it had massive geopolitical importance, uh, they were relaxed, largely relaxed. There was lots of aid um, from the US in particular to South Korea that made it possible for them to pursue an industrial strategy that most developing countries would not be able to pursue. And they had persistent deficits for decades, right? But they had external financing coming in and sustaining these deficits. Um, and of course, they were able to uh, control trade and control capital uh, in a way that many developing countries today aren't able to do. So that was South Korea in a minute. Now, Indonesia, quickly. So again, the historical approach is really important to understand how 
the limits to global value chains, I would say, in the case of Indonesia. Um, so the formation um, or how capitalism and colonialism interacted with each other in Indonesia was very different from the case of South Korea. Uh, it was much more extractive. The economy was oriented towards extraction of raw materials. Um, and what's interesting is, so the five leading exports that accounted for 70% of exports in 1900 still did 90 years later in 1990. The, the, the five leading exports were still the same. Um, and they still accounted for 70% of exports. So that says something about the um, uh, durability of these economic structures. Um, and then also to understand how global value chains developed, it's important to also look at the developmentalist policies that were pursued by Suharto in the 50s and 60s. And uh, he also did um, receive quite a lot of support from Japan in particular for geopolitical reasons. But um, they ran into, um, uh, there were limits to the developmental policies. And in the end, Indonesia also had to go through structural adjustment programs. Um, and in terms of production structures, of course, that's important to study in order to understand the economy and how global value chains are implemented. Um, and um, so you saw some successful upgrading, especially in the logging industry in Indonesia. And that was um, not just through like, it's impossible to understand it just through firm, firm level analysis, with it, which is what a lot of the global value chain literature how it approaches development. Um, we need to also look at yeah, the resource endowments of the country and the state support that Indonesia received. And also in the 70s and 80s, there was also historical timing because there was massive demand for, um, for these exports. But this relatively successful industry exists uh, next to very low productivity sectors. Uh, which also leads to limits to industrialization, right? And this is what dependency theorists wrote about at length, this dual economy. Um, in terms of external constraints, there were some that were relaxed during the period when Indonesia was developing relatively rapidly, uh, partly because of oil revenues, partly because of geopolitical support, but still there were, the constraints were in the end hard and they had to go to the IMF. So, yeah, yeah, of course. I don't think I'll take more than five minutes. Um, yeah. So, unfashionable, but not um, outdated, I would say. Uh, it can explain South, you can use it to understand South Korea better. You can use it to understand Indonesia better. And um, I think that's important because constraints to structural transformation and finance tend to be poorly understood by economists. But we do see that there are these hierarchies. Ingrid, I know this is a horrible question, but could you try to uh, start wrapping and, uh, up in there about are five minutes? There are inequalities in the world that need explaining. So then I argue that dependency Perfect. theory, which takes these inequalities as a starting point, can be a fruitful starting point or, or, or avenue to understand those issues. Mm. And almost finally, uh, I just wanted to put some more recent work on the slide here that you can look at. Uh, so I pulled out some of the key insights from dependency theorists and, um, for example, falling terms of trade for exports, which I mentioned very briefly, um, which uh, Prebish and Singer talked about. Um, there's been work that documents this um, existing for peripheral countries today, by UNCTAD, for example, and also Ocampo, uh, an ability of peripheral countries to borrow in their own currency on international markets is something that's talked about a lot. So it's like a um, symptom of dependence that you can see in the global system today. Um, there's been a fall in the share of domestic value added associated with many developing countries integrating into global value chains. Um, Tarabella and Zhao have written about this recently. And there's lots of scholars that have gone about documenting unequal exchange in different ways, which is like one of the auxiliary hypotheses of dependency theory. So those are just some sources for you to look at. And I believe the PowerPoint will be put on the 
website when, uh, at the end of this session. So, conclusion. If we want to understand global inequality and constraints to production and finance in the periphery, I think a dependency research program can help. Um, and this is particularly urgent, especially given what we see now in the wake of COVID, global inequalities and constraints are um, only getting stronger. Uh, and dependency theory has been excluded through a political process. Uh, so it's not like, it's not legitimate to call it outdated or irrelevant or ep epistemologically weak because those critiques are um, based on a misunderstanding of what dependency theory is. Um, although, as I mentioned, I do think the epistemological critique is worth taking into account in certain uh, regards. Um, also, if we want to push a research pro program forward, we want to include um, insights that are relevant, like, for example, gender, uh, race. There are ways of, um, like, dependency theory was often critiqued for not being able to incorporate these issues. But um, some aspects of dependency theory, or some theories within dependency theory, actually did. And Christopher Kai writes about this in um, at length in his book from 1989. So basically, uh, the research program would need to preserve the strengths, but to also push forward and um, beyond what dependency theory was in the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Ingrid. Uh, just a brief question to you. Uh, could you maybe move your screen a little bit to the right because there's a lot of light in your surrounding and it's reflecting, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I'd like to say- It's to sunny in the UK. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you're lucky, so. <laughs> Um, so uh, to all the attendees, I'd like to uh, repeat again that you can put all your questions in the Q&A tab. And if you like a question, you can upvote it by endorsing it with a thumbs up. Uh, but first, uh, Rodrigo and I will start asking you some questions. So uh, Ingrid, uh, thanks a lot again. Um, I have the honor to ask you the first question. Um, so yeah, to me, when I read your work on dependency theory, uh, I really don't understand why it's outdated because it all seems quite... Yeah, to the point and obvious to me. Um, so I wanted to ask you something about this. Uh, you write in one of your articles that uh, it's time we leave the ideological battles over knowledge production aside so that we can acknowledge the hierarchies and dependencies in our global economy. End of quote. And that's also uh, yeah, the politics of knowledge production that you mentioned earlier. It was also a theme that Andrew Fisher uh, spoke of uh, two weeks ago. Um, so, yeah. At the same time, part of your explanation regarding uh, the marginalization of dependency theory relates to the fact that it's uh, ideolo ideologically and politically driven, right? Because of the neoclassical dominance, for example. So when you write that we should leave aside the ideological battles, what do you exactly mean? Uh, and does this also imply that dependency theory is uh, by any chance free of ideology? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Maybe that's not a good phrase, <laughs> but what I mean by the, so, and I'm glad you asked it so that I can clarify that uh, I don't think that dependency theory is free of um, ideology at all. I think ideology is key in like the production of knowledge um, and in all social sciences. And um, we should forefront that and like bring it out uh, and like have more discussion about the ideological underpinnings of um, social science theories, uh, dependency theory, I mean, it focuses on, well, a lot of it focuses on class rather than individuals. It focuses on inequality. It focuses on the, um, the polarizing tendencies of capitalism, which there are ideologies associated with the way dependency theorists approach, um, approach economic questions or socioeconomic questions. And, and in the same way that there are ideological underpinnings of the way that neoclassical economics approaches uh, economic questions where they focus on individuals um, and see in individuals as separate and uh, rational, optimizing, uh, and markets as perfect, and imperfections as deviations from that perfect ideal. Um, so when I say I want to, uh, that we should leave the ideological battles behind, I think what I really mean is that um, we shouldn't... Um, like dependency theory shouldn't be excluded based on ideology. Um, that's something that, well, happened, right? <laughs> um, it should be like 
it shouldn't be dismissed based on ideology. But I would like to 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 say that um, I would like to actually bring the ideological battle back in, I guess, and and have us talk more about the ideologies of social sciences uh, and um, allow the debates to happen within economics departments within other social science departments and in policy as well. Um, so more pluralism. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I I've, have I've, um, a question of a different type. Um, but first of all, I, I really like the, the, the way you conceptualize um, dependency theory as a, as a research program. Uh, yeah, I, I myself, I also, I didn't read beyond uh, Gunther Frank. Uh, and uh, I don't know if all of these intricacies uh, di uh, and all of the detailed differences, but um, yeah, it's 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 you allow for much a much more plural understanding of of, of these sets of theories, which I think is is um, is very interesting. And so you separate the core issues um, that that they all have in common, and 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 and, uh, and, uh, and some auxiliary hypothesis uh, that well. That are questioned by by by, by several theorists, um, and one of these uh, auxiliary hypotheses is is the role of uh, monopoly capitalism in uh, in dependency, um, and I, and I have a question about that because um, of course in in the 1970s, uh, well there was a lot of debate on uh, monopoly capitalism. Um, it was a time of uh, late capitalism of Ernest Mandel and uh, Paul Sweezy and uh, uh, but since since then, of course, we have had this period of globalization, uh, a lot of global foreign direct investments, um, and lar a large part of these foreign direct investments were mergers and acquisitions, well, which led to a, an ever well, larger concentration of corporate power. So in my understanding, you could say that there's quite a difference between the type of transnational corporation that existed in the 1970s compared to the ones we have now, uh, especially with the, the the much larger power they have in this global value change, so so this is more a question on the empirical level. Do you think that this that that first that we have a different type of transnational corporation, and and secondly, what would this imply for uh, dependency uh, the dependency approach or the research program of dependency theories? Yeah, great question. <laughs> so. Um... And you're right that monopoly capitalism, I mean, dependency theory is often associated with monopoly capitalism, which I think in a way is um, is not really helpful either, um, because that excludes a lot of the um, scholarship that I would include in the dependency theory tradition that doesn't think that monopoly capitalism is, um, is the driving force. And I don't personally think monopoly capitalism is the most helpful way to think about um, polarizing tendencies of capitalism. Um, but uh, to your more specific question on um, transnational corporations, they definitely have changed, for sure. They're different than the, the way that they were. Um, they're structured differently. Um, they operate in developing countries in a different way. Um, and I think that's kind of what I tried to demonstrate with the example of Indonesia, um, that even though countries are able to in, like, integrate and be a part of um, development or manufacturing in a, in a more active way than they were, or at least some countries were um, in the past. It doesn't mean that um, aspects of dependency and the constraints that they face uh, are any less acute um, or any less relevant. Actually, they appear to be more relevant um, and the polarizing tendencies are still there. Um, so, you know, although the yeah, transnational corporations played a large role, like when Portado was writing, it was that they were mostly in the ISI um, sector oriented towards domestic economy. Now they tend to be more in the export uh, sector. Um, but I think that that's, you know, that's okay. Production is structured differently, but it still, you know, has that same drive. And uh, what I think is important um, in that context is that the global value chain people, the GVC crowd, which tends to look more at the firm level, um, like a industry at the firm level and look at policies um, that affect the firms in a very kind of um, um, atomistic way. So I think that the 
that literature needs to also take on um, into account that how you know historically production emerged, how that affects how a country integrates into global value chains. Uh, Will Milberg is someone who's done quite good work on this. He published recently on it. He does use the term monopoly capitalism uh, to look at sort of intellectual property rights as well. Um, so I think what it means to to get to the question of what it means for the research program is I think it actually provides lots of fertile ground for more research to understand these issues better. Thank you, uh, Sarah. I think we had more questions, but uh, I think that because there's so many people uh, participating that, that have questions, maybe it's better to leave it to the to the people to decide which questions we should ask. I think that's the most democratic way forward, Rodrigo. And we have so many great questions there in the Q and A tab. Uh, so please continue uh, endorsing questions you like. I'll just start with uh, the bottom uh, one, uh, which is, sorry, the top one, which is by Stefan Haag. Um, so uh, he thanks you very much for the interesting presentation. And then the question is, if I understood it correctly, one key argument against dependency theory is that it neglects agency from actors in the global south. You said that this is partly wrong. How do you defend dependency theory against this approach, Ingrid? Yeah. Great question. Um, so uh, I think there are a few different ways of answering it. And um, I would say that most of dependency theory takes the external constraint as a given almost. Um, and then they're studying what's going on in the particular country that they're interested in and how that relates to the global economy. Um, so in that sense, when the critique, and it was often came against Frank, of um, of dependency theory focusing too much on external constraints, that's, it's missing kind of what dependency theorists were actually doing. They were, you know, very much concerned with what was going on in Brazil, in Chile, in Argentina, the different actors that were involved in um, trying to create dependence. And a lot of it was about the limits of import substitution industrialization and like looking at agents, agents within the country as well as, um, as well as outside. Um, and they weren't um, saying that you know uh, agents within the global south couldn't do anything. They were kind of uh, looking at the constraints and what the possibilities were. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I see it as a misreading. And there's different aspects. I mean, you could go like if you go kind of to the conservative side of dependency theory, you have Cardoso, who where it's all about agents, and maybe he goes like maybe too far in looking at how. <laughs> the possible agency that um, countries in the global or actors in the global south have and downplays the external constraint. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's the that's how I would defend it. I would like to um, well ask another question that also has a question uh, it's a question about agency. Um, it's uh, by uh, Desiree Poets. I hope I pronounce her name her name correctly. Um, so I wanted to ask for sources that discuss the role, sorry, the role of indigenous people and or race uh, and gender in the historical development of uh, dependent economies and the ongoing uh, reproduction of dependency. I know Clovis yeah. and Maura in Brazil did some work on race, but other suggestions would be super helpful. Yeah. So, um, my mind is blanking on names, but um, and I can't find the Christopher K book, although I know I have it here somewhere. Uh, but his book from 1989, Chapter 3 in that book, is all about race and uh, dependency. So you'll find lots of um, scholars mentioned there. I know I also have some sources in my paper called Beyond the Stereotype, um, something, something, dependency theory. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my... Well, great. <laughs> kind of we, can, we, can put, we can put it on the website and then that's it, a, it's a, it's a very uh, efficient way of answering the question. And, 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 and it, it's, well, you, it, is a, it is also a good quest, uh, answer because people can really uh, dig into the answer. Uh, Sarah, would you like to uh, read another yes, question? I'd love to because there's still many open questions. And I must say, Ingrid, you're very good at actually answering them very concisely. So let's continue that. Uh, the next question is by, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Gassen Ben Khalifa, uh, who says, thanks for this relevant presentation. Uh, then the question, one of the main recommendations of the dependency theory, especially in 
Tamir Amine, is the de-linking from the global capitalist system. To what extent is this policy still possible today for the countries in the global south, and especially for countries of the Arab region? Deglobalization. Yeah, great, 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 great question. Um, so I think, um, so de-linking, when Samir Amin wrote about it, he, I think it's often, um, I'm sure that, I mean, the question asker doesn't misunderstand it, but just for the general uh, audience, that uh, it doesn't mean like autarky, <laughs> shutting yourself off from uh, the global economy, right? The way Samir Amin saw it was um, reorienting your, the, your priorities, your national priorities towards the needs of the people rather than the needs of global capital. And he saw it as something that was almost impossible to do completely. Um, like in some of his work, he talks about how like, oh, China dealing 70% and <laughs> Senegal is possible, was able to deal in 10%, yeah, which is a kind of a weird way of categorizing delinking. But anyway, um, so, um, and I think that in a way, so with that kind of definition of delinking in mind, um, you could argue that, yeah, South Korea in a way delinked because it managed its um, production and its economy and it oriented towards the needs of the, at least the uh, domestic capitalists rather than the global capitalists. Um, using policies that aren't that um, acceptable today. So there is, um, there is that element that it's more difficult today to delink. It's more difficult to use trade policies or intervene in trade the way that South Korea did. Um, and, um, and the same with, it's more difficult to use finance uh, product or um, proactively in the way that South Korea did. Um, so that said, yes, it's more difficult um, to delink. Uh, it's still possible. There is policy space there. Um, more policy space than developing countries are using. And this is something both Danny Roderick in the mainstream and Tendika Manik on the heterodox side have written about quite a bit that a lot of the time it's not like it's impossible for developing countries to implement proactive developmental policies. It's actually quite neoliberal uh, uh, polis politicians in the global south and also, of course, more uh, political influence from the IMF, the World Bank, um, that isn't necessarily disavowing it, but strongly discouraging uh, tariffs, etc. Um, that said, even if a country were to implement these policies and go against the WTO and, and whatever, uh, be more proactive, there's still, it's still going to meet limits, right? Because it's, uh, within the global economy, uh, there are these contradictions and external constraints. So it's still, um, a limited policy, but I think there's definitely space to push for it more than what has been done so far. Wouldn't you say that instead of um, focusing on possibilities for delinking, it is much more important to change the, the structural conditions uh, and, yes. and, the, and, the, and the institutions that push for them uh, or, or uphold them, like IMF, uh, well, and WTO, et cetera. That's a great way of putting it, yeah. It's because it's, a, yeah, exactly. It's so difficult for a country, like you actually need to change the whole global system in order to make it possible for countries to do what they want to do. I, I would like to continue with, a, with another question um, by um, Netson Noma. Um, how, would you, how would the dependency theory research program address critiques from post-development or alternative development schools that question the relevance of centering progress on modernization, such as industrialization? Um, and a top-down st status development program that follows dependency theory, respectively. And then he adds, sorry for the long question. Don't be sorry. It's a great question. <laughs> uh, and thank you for that. Um, I think it's a really important question. And um, again, I think that um, it's true to some extent that dependence, some aspects of dependency theory are kind of falling in the same trap as modernization theory by just trying to just, you know, promote industrialization and, uh, but saying that, you know, we need to do different things to achieve that than just open up and, and um, liberalize. Um, but I think, again, like I mentioned, Celso Portado was basically uh, writing about the limits of industrialization in Brazil and uh, not really promoting industrialization in the way that modernization theorists do. Um, so, 
I think the dependency theory program is much richer than than just like promoting industrialization. Um, but that said, um, I think that um, there there is important um, kind of debates to be had within postcolonial scholarship and dependency theory. Like, what is development? Do we need to just problematize and get rid of the term development altogether? Um, there is some great literature on on uh, this debate. Uh, Kapoor wrote one not too long ago that uh, basically compares and, and contrasts and figures out like what are the strengths of dependency theory versus postcolonial theory and post development. And like from a dependence or like more like I guess materialist perspective, I would say that there are some like the dependency program is about production and about you know material benefits to production or how those benefits don't actually accrue to people in the global south. So. Um, there are like material things that we want to improve in the periphery, um, health and education, like you know, quality of life. Um, so there are some things that I don't think can be kind of dismissed for being Western and and associated with development and Western notions of progress because they are actually about you know human beings being able to actually survive. Um, so I think that's an important aspect of dependency theory that post-colonial theory in a way, or some aspects of post-colonial theory, neglect. Sorry, uh, we have a, uh, only a limited amount of time, but just a very small follow-up. Do you think that an e the ecological question or climate change changed also the nature of this, the need to develop? Uh, I don't think it changed the need to develop, if you mean development being people being able to live, you know, happy, comfortable lives, um, or the need to, you know, um, redistribute and rebalance the global economy. Uh, of course, it changed the way we think about what kind of industries are possible to use as a way to develop. Um, and there's, but there's some fruitful avenues of research that actually, I'm not that familiar with it, but there are some climate uh, economists and environmental economists that are using like the concept of unequal exchange to also talk about like unequal the unequal impacts of climate change and and pollution. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, that's something that needs to be incorporated and and included like urgently in any all our thinking about progress. All right, Ingrid, let's try to do maybe two more questions or one more, we'll see. Uh, so the upper one now is by Bikram Gill, uh, which is quite long, but I'll try to summarize it. So the question itself is what role does the relative success and cons consolidation of decolonization play in explaining how a state is able to integrate into global networks on less dependent terms? So what does the role uh, the relative success and consolidation of decolonization play in explaining how a state is able to integrate into global networks on less dependent terms. And then at the end, I think there's an important punchline which says perhaps African states could not access such favorable terms due to the absence of a consolidated decolonial state as regional counterpower. Uh, could you reflect on that? If it's clear to you. Mm, I'm not sure about the last part, but... Um... But yeah, so the first part is the most important. Yeah, what role does the relative success and consolidation of decolonization play? Um, so I mean, of course, decolonization was incredibly important to uh, allow countries to get have more space to develop. And uh, of course, like during colonial times, it was extremely the, ex the exploitation was extremely coercive. Um, with decolonization, there was more policy space. Uh, and so, yes, you could say that they gave more space for uh, independent policies. Uh, and you saw that also in, um, you're referring specifically to African countries, that there were lots of pretty radical uh, progressive governments that um, tried to counteract the dependent relations that had been established during colonialism. They tried to, well, they did implement ISI in many cases. Um, some of these radical politicians were assassinated. <laughs> so it was like a very, you know, it's life and death um, issue um, after after um, decolonization. So it wasn't like they had, you know, 
they were they were getting the support to do this from the U.S. and the uh, former colonizers. Uh, so they had yeah they had some space, but it was you know still a very hostile global environment. Um, but uh, and then of course the limits were reached when you know the they were most of the countries were using external financing to um, support ISI ran into debt difficulties and then eventually had to go to the IMF and the World Bank and were entered into the lost decades where all of these attempts to rebalance and reorient the economy were undone. Um, and yeah, so I would say that decolonization did lead to some uh, different scenario where there was more space, but that that space was then closed again. Uh, and of course, now there's more space than there was during colonialism. It's like a different, of course, a very different uh, global economy. Uh, but it's very, it's still not, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that these countries are autonomous to do whatever they want, because there are these like hard constraints on foreign currency, on access to technology, um, access to finance. Yeah. Hmm. And very, very briefly, just... For the non-expert audience, uh, ISI is import substitution industrialization. Yep, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, what will we do? Uh, so we ask one final question, or um, it's it's up to you. Well, I, I think you may. Okay, so we're, it's we are running a bit late because it's already one minute after five. But well, we, we'll this, ask Ingrid to answer within one minute. <laughs> well. <laughs> It's a bit, a bit unfair because it's we created this problem. But um, <laughs> yeah. do you find dependency approaches useful to read contemporary patterns uh, of China, Chinese, Latin America, African relations? And the question is posed by uh, Ximena Zapata. I think so. Yeah, um, I think, uh, and there is some literature. I mean, there is quite a lot of literature on it. I don't think sometimes. It maybe simplifies a bit too much, like um, um, that now China is playing the same role as um, France or England. I don't think it's the same. It's different. Uh, but in terms of um, looking at the, how China, for example, is able to um, um, relax some of the constraints that some uh, Latin American countries or African countries are facing by providing certain kinds of finance, certain kinds of aid, uh, certain kinds of support um, is key to understand what's going on. And they're a very important player in Africa and Latin America. And um, so I think uh, I think it can, it, it's like important to, to, to look at uh, that from a dependency lens as well and how they interact with yeah, the production, how they impact the production there. And there's, I mean, now I know I'm probably going on too long, but... Um, no, no, yeah, the, well, yeah. just, just one, one question. When you say uh, relaxing, because creating demand perhaps for the, the their uh, raw commodities, mm -hmm. uh, do you mean that thereby um, they, uh, they created better conditions for development or they just recreated new forms of dependency relations? Yeah, I think uh, that in, in one sense, uh, they create space for um, autonomous policies that, you know, for example, with the, the commodity boom, there was space for African and Latin America, American countries to pursue quite a few more active policies, which most of them didn't do, but <laughs> could have done that. Um, so the, the raw materials is one, but also they provide aid and, um, and hard currency in some instances. Uh, but then I think the dependency theory uh, program is important in order to understand, yeah, the renewed, like how does it actually change ownership, re you know, relations of production uh, within the country? How, how, are, how does it help those countries actually develop their own technology, their own innovation, their own industry? And I think that's where dependency theory can, can help to... Uh, take our attention to those questions, which I think then leads us to see that there is a lot of dependence still in that relationship. I'm afraid we will have to ask you for another time to uh, continue uh, uh, this talk. Um, but uh, Sarah, maybe you would like to um, 
and uh, this yeah I, I wouldn't like to but I, i'm afraid i have to uh so thank you so much uh ingrid i think it was really a great presentation and also uh the way you answered all those questions really awesome and uh, i wish we could continue but well maybe we can in the way that uh, you can still share a lot of links and articles and of course all the attendees can check that out um, we'll of course also put a recording and a transcript of this presentation uh, online and I must say there was a lot of uh, people uh, in the Q&A tab saying they really thank you a lot for both your paper and your presentation so thanks on behalf of us all I'd like to say and also thank to all the attendees for participating uh, in this webinar of Crash Course um, I hope you enjoyed it uh, everything will be published as soon as possible online and uh, I'd like to point to the fact our next session will be on the 5th of November and it will be featuring Eva uh, Karwowski. And she works at the University of uh, Hertfordshire and her expertise centers on finance, financialization and development. Um, so if you want to uh, stay updated, uh, you can subscribe yourself to our newsletter. Um, I can show you how that works. So you can see my screen now. This is uh, the third session here. You can sign up and then uh, you can here click on signing up for the newsletter as well and if you do that uh, you'll make sure that you're not missing anything out uh, so for now uh, thanks a lot uh, that's it from our side and uh, hope to see you all again and thanks again to ingrid for everything yeah thank you so much for having me and thank you also to i just looked through the q a box and this amazing questions there and i feel um, like we could have had another hour of discussion but <laughs> We time. could have. Well, maybe <laughs> we should reflect on uh, on uh, doing another session one time. That would be great. Thank so you. thanks a lot and uh, see you all next time. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.